there is a recognition by the Burmese empire, emperor, that this land is basically Maitai land. They are leasing it. Leasing it. Leasing it. A compensation. Who is our Prime Minister Nehru? The great Mr. Nehruji. <laughs> yes, he just gave it away. Gave away. Yes. So, you can see that slowly British intervention happened. The Presbyterians and Baptists continued. Fascinating. And the entire of the, the sifting into Christian population Majority happened after independence. Mm, exactly. This is erasure of culture. Absolute. Absolute devastation of culture. Nothing left. Mm. And some of them are struggling now. Mm. Like Com. Com. Mary Com. Mary Com. Yeah. So some of them claim that uh, we are part of the Cookie Federation group. Mm -hmm. Some are saying, no, we don't want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. So, and they are having existential crisis. Okay. So if they are next to the militant Cookie groups, then you have to survive. Today, I'm very open. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm taking risks, but I let me be honest. Many Maitis tell me, why do you say that? But as a scholar, I should be honest to myself, not guided by your political compulsion of the time. Because your political position, which people think you should take, may be misguided. Dr. Oinam, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. My pleasure. So, sir, uh, we, I would like this discussion to be about Manipur, about what's happening in Manipur. I obviously have my own views about this and my audience would be well aware of that. But I would like to hear your views about what's happening. And the objective is to give a good perspective of the situation and the roots of the situation and possible solutions to an audience that doesn't know much about Manipur. So that's what I would like to do. So first of all, let's begin with the very basics. Where is Manipur and what are the ethnic groups in Manipur? Well, uh, it is like this. Uh, if you go by the government officials record, mm. uh, apart from the Maitai uh, and this majority so-called, now they are not absolute majority anymore, but Maitai comp comprises of uh, three sections. Mm. One is Maitai Hindus, uh, those who are following Gaura, some. Gauriya Vaishnavism. Mm -hmm. The other one is Maiti Shanamahi, mm -hmm. those who uh, follow still the pre Vaishnavite religious practices. They are also Maiti, same language, mm -hmm. uh, same vicinity, live together. Yes. And the third is the Maiti Pangal. Mm -hmm. So, whether you want to differentiate them separately, they are the Manipuri Muslims. Correct. But they speak the same Maiti loan, the Manipuri language. So, that way, these three clusters mm -hmm. should be seen as one. Right. This is mine. So, these are Maitis. Then you have uh, 39 different tribes. Mm -hmm. They are recognized tribe by the state. Okay. But today, if you talk to anyone, for instance, they will say there are three groups, Maitai, Nagas, and Kukis. Right. That's how it's seen right now. Yeah. yeah. But uh, if you look into this, even if you go by these three, mm -hmm. this is not exhaustive. Mm -hmm. There are many tribes who are put under the conglomeration of the Nagas, Tangful, okay. Mao. Maram, all this, mm -hmm. Paumai. Then you have the Kuki groups whom you call Paite, Simte, Gangte, then is uh, Thado, right? Mm -hmm. But still many forget and they are almost absent mm -hmm. from our discourse are those who are neither Nagas, nor Kukis, nor Maitis. Okay. They are almost unheard and mm -hmm. some of them are struggling now, mm -hmm. like Kom. Kom. Mary Kom. Mary Kom. Yeah. So some of them claim that uh, we are part of the Cookie Federation group. Mm -hmm. Some are saying, no, we don't want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. So, and they are having existential crisis. Okay. If they are next to the militant Cookie groups, then you have to survive. And those Koms who are next to the Maitis in the vicinity, sharing the paddy fields, trade transactions, small time. So they want, don't want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. They say that we are Kom and we had been since there. Of course, the British ethnographers, they uh, tried to study their livelihood style, pattern of cultivation and all that. And they talk about old cookie and the new cookies. Okay. So old cookies, many have, of them are even claiming to be Nagas. Mm -hmm. Anal, for instance. Okay. They are next to the Mori areas, many of them. But... The, the the ethnographers would call them because of their pattern of livelihood and so on mm -hmm. as old cookie in terms of linguistic and other. 
but politically many claim to be part of the nagas okay so uh, i think this naga cookie is a term or political concept frankly speaking hmm. so these were agglomerations created by outsiders essentially the british umbrella obviously. terms Absolutely. obviously the british yeah. for the sake of their own uh, interests convenience absolutely. absolutely right now we have mithilon the manipuri language which is called not the mithi language but the manipuri language manipuri, yes now how old is this language see uh, it's very easy for anyone just to say code 33 ad mm -hmm. but that is only a narrative of the ningthousa dynasty okay. there was a clan called ningthousa who ruled yes but prior to that there are many uh, tribals leader in fact i would go by this line there was no community in the world who were not tribals yeah every complex society the what was vedic society there are agrarian or even they were tribal community very pastoral very pastoral yes so subsequently you increase your population <laughs> your mode of production if you use the marxian terminology mm -hmm. that is how the growth have happened yes so uh, maitis are also conglomeration of different tribe and ethnicity going far back in time far back in time mm -hmm. and i would like to add one more point if you look at uh, how myanmar mm. was uh, how how buddhism came to myanmar yes. or burma at the point mm -hmm. one was it came from sri lanka mm -hmm. ceylon mm -hmm. right ashoka san mahendra then going to that another sea route uh, i am not an expert in that but this is what i have learned that there is also buddhism traveling through land route mm -hmm. and this land route because you have buddhist uh, segments in brahmaputra valley yes and this must have gone through the finding is through imphal valley mm -hmm. and there are many scholars who believe and there are books written on this uh, professor mohendro who was uh, i uh, teaching in a college at one point mm -hmm. he has written that uh, maitis were basically buddhist before uh, the hinduism came okay so there are also narratives of this kind but you have to substantiate this much more with archaeological evidence yes, and other absolutely. forms of evidence but the point that i am making is hmm. that uh, buddhism coming to myanmar mm -hmm. is not merely from the sea route but also from the north could be multiple and, points of entry yeah. Yeah. and if it is from the north it has to be from assam from manipur these are the two routes most trade transaction that happens is from assam and also from manipur logically logically yes so uh if that is the case you cannot imagine a community which are supposedly culturally little more complex mm. i will not talk about hierarchy but complexity mm -hmm. who says seen mixture of traditions mm -hmm. maiti manipuris are one of them so to imagine that this community must have been untouched by mm. trade transaction or people religious this is impossible that's ludicrous really yes so that is what i say that uh, even before christ mm. this whole narratives uh, must be seen that it is our talking about maitis uh, very exclusively of this seven or nine clans uh, i think there are stories much earlier than that mm -hmm. and we need to collaborate with uh, burmese writing mm -hmm. and also from many of the writings in the uh ahom and other uh, literary traditions mm -hmm. yeah. but the accepted narrative is that the manipuri language is about 2000 years old at least that is what is believed that first century ad mm -hmm. uh, as far as i my knowledge goes the mm -hmm. script came up somewhere say in the 1100 okay so even if the historians are not very particular you make 100 or 50 years up and down this mm -hmm. side so it must be 11 to 12th century okay the script yeah script this okay. was so it is almost uh, it's in the brahmi hmm. pattern yes and uh, uh, assam is the the language mm -hmm. the script also is coterminous with at the same time i see that is what uh, people have found it out right. so when the script has come in 11 the the lang the language the mm -hmm. parol that must have been much earlier naturally that's how it always is the language precedes the script by a significant uh, amount of time right right yeah. so the manipuri language is, is let's say roughly 2000 years old minimum yeah now which ethnic group is the originator of the manipuri language 
these are basically the maites surprise but the, <laughs> but the point is even who who are maites hmm. uh, it might sound a little controversial but let us be uh, clear on this it is in the puyas that is the uh, uh, what you call royal chronicles yes right? and i had the good fortune of sitting down with some of the scholars traditional scholars and uh, hearing from them mm -hmm. uh, that is that uh, out of different tribes the one who were in the heart of the imphal valley mm -hmm. the kangla area yes uh, they were the dominant groups okay so mangang they that are called so slowly they control the other community sometimes through war battles or sometimes through matrimonial alliances and so on this is natural evolution uh, yeah so that is how the the community expanded different tribes mm -hmm. are merged under one uh, umbrella group mm -hmm. and maitei's uh, names there are many names they are called kathe by the burmese so uh, there are different names given to this group by the assamese differently mm -hmm. but the point is uh, different principalities or tribes they came together mm -hmm. and my finding in terms of my learning from the traditional scholars is that many so called now hill tribes were also merged into the maiti confederation okay there is not only seven or nine mm -hmm. but there are many more many tankuls were merged into the maitis mm -hmm. many so called what you are calling thados mm -hmm. or paiti they were also merged into the maiti confederation at various points in time at very various points in time okay. and to say that only from 1800 no it is much earlier much there earlier. has been mixing up mm -hmm. so that way maiti or the manipuri community is much more evolved is a it's a culmination of or meeting point of different tribes mm -hmm. and that is how the language evolved mm -hmm. yeah and if if i add one more that even uh, say from 15th century or even earlier than that but we know from the time of khagemba where the kangla present kangla stays uh, the influence of what you called the the bengal Hmm? and the people who come from bengal are called pangal bengal pangal bangal bangal pangal okay bengal is a british donation uh, yes it's a bangal bangal bangal, yeah. bangal bangal right yes. so from there you call the muslim who migrated as pangal okay so pangal emergence is around 15th century mm -hmm. and uh, they are helping not only in the military art craft uh, or fair but also in wet rice cultivation okay paddy cultivation was their help i support from the uh, bengali muslims migration and they also became part of it the brahmins they also became part of the maitei community so that way i would say the maiteis are much more evolved a complex society so you mentioned khagenga khagemba mm -hmm. he is a king who conquered yunnan right there is a story about that but mm -hmm. how far it is true i do not know but uh there is a now it is almost dilapidated the bridge mm -hmm. uh i'm i'm forgetting the exact name mm -hmm. uh, in the heart of the imakai till next to that uh, th there is there's a brick bridge of that time okay and it is said that the the people who were Uh, prisoners captured. of war yeah prisoners of war they were made to build this I because see. the big building was not the expertise of the maitis it came from outside which is interesting because if you go to kangla fort you have these layers below the soil yeah. where you can find bricks yes, which is like yes. way older yeah so, it was it was in his time khagemba's time the entire structure even the market mm -hmm. the today you are seeing ima kaithil and all this it's a new word kwarambal the ima even ima kaithil is a new word mm. it is a called kwaramban kaithil okay. but before that the women's market was inside the kangla in the southern part so i can even share the article i have edited the book called uh, perspectives on manipuri culture with professor sham kishor singh okay and uh, an article has been there evolution of markets mm -hmm. in manipur interesting so it was in 14th century but it goes time in memorial mm -hmm. because oral tradition says when the market comes but the recorded history is that a uh, women's market was sifted from inside the kangla to outside okay. during the khagembats time i see yeah now we have this other group called the nagas which is a whole lot of different tribes 
which are right now present in northern Manipur, the northern half. Yeah. In the past, they used to be all, be all over the southern half of Manipur also. Right, right. So what's the connection between the Metis and the Nagas, historically and ethnically? See, uh, what uh, you find very commonly, particularly with the Tankhus, and also some of the uh, Annals, I believe, even if they are uh, new Nagas and old cookies, if you use them. Okay. <laughs> uh, Yek and Salai, the clan lineage. In some, you, you in the kinship pattern, you divide people in terms of clans. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the belief is that there should not be intra-clan marriages. Okay. So you should marry from one clan to the other. I see. Okay, to maintain uh, the genetic uh, yeah, yeah, diversity yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So, mm. I don't know whether that was for, but whatever reason it may be, it must be that the experience tells us. Mm -hmm. And when Maiti even became a Hindu, Vaishnava, mm. so this Ye or Salai or clan in English word was coterminously put with Gotra. Okay. So, for instance, Oinam is a Kuman clan. Okay. My name, Oinam, is a Kuman clan. Mm -hmm. But Kuman will be equivalent to, I think, uh, one Gotra, which I'm not Bhardwaz, but uh, there is Madhugala. Okay. So there is Madhugala, uh, Bhardwaz. These are around seven clans that has been Gotra are given. Okay. So this, that is a later Hindu edition. But mm -hmm. the question you raise is the connection between Nagas and Maitis yes. is precisely this clan, Yek Salai, hmm. they also have. So even the Nagas have the same Nagas system? Have, uh, some have three, some have five, some have seven, Okay. depending on the evolvement of the communities. This mm -hmm. is what many Maitis at present are trying to find kinship relationship okay. with the Nagas mm -hmm. and Maitis. Mm -hmm. But this is also a fact. That there was a time there was some hostility also happened. Mm -hmm. Lots of friendship also happened. Okay. There's a part of life. That yes. How, yeah. Right. So we have ancient connections between the Maitis and the Nagas. Now, we know the recorded history of Manipur the past roughly 2000 years. And we have had a succession of kings. Obviously, we have the chronicles of the kings. These kings, which ethnic group did they come from? See, there is a, now you raise a very important question. And uh, let me share my mind as honestly as possible. Yes. I may be wrong. I am subjected to the correctness. But I want to free myself from ideological and political biases, which is happening at the point. Okay. Some of the cookies are saying that one of the kings called Tao Thing Hong, and these names are also very close to Sin Kuki clan names. Okay, it sounds like that. Yeah. And it also is close to the Maitis. If you find some of the linguistic survey mm -hmm. uh, and also ask any cookies, but you can do that. Many of the names for the physical features, my for face, meat for eyes, could for hands, the in Paitis also they have the similar similar language, uh, similar yes, words. Same, same words. Okay. So that means that. Kuki is a later name that has been given. There are a mix of lots of people have migrated, Mars, that must have happened. Mm -hmm. But when the, uh, what you call umpire formation or kingship formation, mm -hmm. the power consolidates, then a different forms of uh, what you call power structure led to different kinship pattern here. Those who could not be merged into this, they remain outside. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there are many Maitis who would say that there is no cookie connection. Cookies come only from the 19th century. Well, uh, if you call cookies by only certain groups that happened during the British period, but my learning from some of the anthropologists who have taught in Manipur universities is that there are, of course, mention of some migration from that side of the, uh, from the Eastern uh, frontier and getting merged with the population of the Maitis. Mm -hmm. So there is in Chaitharal Kumbhava and Royal Chronicles record of people migrating from the East. But they assimilated they are assimilated. harmoniously. Like for instance, and again I am saying it today, I am very open, I am mm -hmm. taking risks, but I let me be honest. Many Maitis tell me, why do you say that? But as a scholar, I should be honest to myself, not guided by your political compulsion of the time. Because your political position, which people think you should take, 
may be misguided. So to be honest to the, uh, uh, the, my academic pursuit, I think I should maintain that mm -hmm. sanctity. And uh, that is, there are surnames within the clan. So one clan is, you call it uh, 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 Mangang, Luang, then my own Oinam is what I said, uh, uh, some other name, uh, Kuman. So within that, there are many sur sub-clans, mm, okay. surnames, right? Mm. And some of the sub-clans, the surnames, it is recorded in Royal Chronicles. They are of the Thado community. Okay, so which would indicate that the Thado have been present in Manipur for a long time. And later yes. on, they were put under the Kuki umbrella okay, yes. category. Yes. No, but those who have assimilated and mingled with the Maiti population, they are still there. Mm -hmm. uh, you can for yourself look out, but there are many, uh, sir, I'm saying the surnames, which have the kuki origin. I'm using the vocabulary kuki, not a good word, because something that happened before the word kuki even came up. So some simte maybe, or some thados, they became part of the Maitis, and they become Vaishnavas. They have merged into the uh, lineage. So at what point in time does this happen, roughly, approximately? See, this has, uh, I'm not a historian, but my reading is that much before the 19th century. Maybe 18th century, 17th century? Maybe 17th century? 17 or something. Okay, so, okay. so reasonably recent. Reasonably yeah, recent. to that extent. Last 300 years or so? Well, you can say. Uh, roughly, that. approximately, yeah. perhaps, yeah. But overall, if you look at the past 2000 years, the kings of Manipur have belonged essentially to the Methi uh, ethnicity, this, right? This ethnicity, right. Have there been any Naga kings or Kuki kings? We haven't come across that. We haven't the come queens, across. Queens, yes. The queens, there is a different story. Different it's a patrilineal thing. Uh -huh, patrilineal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the kings have all been Maithis. Yeah. Right, that's interesting. Now, let's talk about the Kukis. Who are the Kukis? And uh, the, the, the Zo, Zo community, right? It's called? Zochin, whatever See, it is. The problem is the names are changing so much. The names keep changing, the, the, the definitions and the terminology. Used, right? Sometimes you get threat for writing this. Okay. I wrote something in 2001 uh -huh. in Economic and Political Weekly and ZRA at that time threatened me for this. ZRA? ZRA. Okay. No, still they are there. It's still there, yeah, very yeah. much so. Mm. Uh, my argument was that the nomenclature and consolidation of group's identity mm -hmm sometimes are newly formed, but you want to create a long history of that. Mm. So you invent some history. You invent. Mm. And uh, perhaps this is needed because you have to consolidate your political power. Legitimacy. Legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So uh, Kuki and Paites had terrible fight among themselves. Mm. Mar and Kukis were fighting, right? So Kukis were the Thados, were the first one to get settled tribe status. Paite did not get, Mar did not have. When the Paites and Mar wanted to be included in the scheduled tribe status in the state of Manipur, Kukis protested. And there were huge fight, a year long fight and so on. But today, look at this. Today in 2023 and 24, all our MERS, thanks to the political hmm. uh, bad governance of the state, I would put it like that, not talking to any political party per se. But they have called themselves Kuki Jo. Kuki Jo. And they have all put together Jomi sometimes. Jomi, yeah. And then the aspiration is for Jalengam. Jalengam. The land of the Kuki Jo people. Yeah. So, but how long is it going to happen? Because this is also a political project. Hmm. So it may fail, it may succeed. It is history to tell. Yeah. Now, these Kukis, are they Burmese? Do they speak the Burmese language? Do they practice Burmese culture? I think they are ethnic minorities. If you go by the Burmese in the sense of Burman. Yes. Uh, Burmans are mainly inhabited in the central and the south southern part of Burma. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the northern part of Burma, eastern part of Burma where the San province are, in the western side, south uh, in uh, uh, what you call northwestern of Burma, which is next to Manipur mm. and Nagaland. Mm -hmm. Then if you go to the western Chin province, which is next to uh, Mizoram and then Bangladesh. So these 
peripheral provinces are all ethnic minorities. And there has been a long struggle of power sharing and also consolidation of their own ethnicity and political power. Mm -hmm. And the Qin are uh, ethnic minorities and they had been wanting to be away free from the Burmese rule. And that is what is happening today. The, the question is, where did they come from? Historically, we know Burma has been Burmese, but right now, in the past few centuries, the Qin are there, the Zomi are there. Did they come from Yunnan or further east well, to Burma? Uh, that I cannot say for sure. But if you look at the memory, hmm. the folklore and all that, uh, many, even some of the Maitis claim that, that they have come from this or come from that. So people have been migrating. but. More than anybody else, this is the, what the British, British anthropologists found, is that uh, the what they call cookies are mostly nomadic. In okay. the sense, their pattern of livelihood, hmm. their pattern of cultivation. Slash and burn? Slash and burn. They keep moving from one place to the other. Uh -huh. uh, they still follow the kingship, the, the chieftainship. Chieftainship. Yeah. Okay. So the, so the eldest son will be the chief. So what do you do with the younger ones? So either you have to be subsumed under your elder brother. You move away. Or you move away and create a new uh, village. Uh -huh. That is the practice that everybody wants to become a chip. Of course. So mm. that is how the nomadic nature of the cookies mm. tells that uh, they keep on moving. And even they have moved as far as uh, Kashar Hills in mm. Assam mm -hmm. and with Karbi's uh, the, the Marshals, they had also had conflict because naturally you are moving and the two of land for... You're encroaching on somebody else's somebody. territory. And there is no clear cut bifurcation by saying that this is my land, but people are using. Hmm. So when the Marshals felt that the land which they had been traditionally using are being intruded hmm. by uh, unknown communities, hmm. then the fight begins. Hmm. That has been happening. Karbis with the Marshals. So this is the the story that what you were asking how the cookies come their migratory nature is much more than the others i am not saying that others are not migratory mm. migration is a part of a universal it's part of human, human history yeah. of course so when you have a settled population and when you have a migratory population typically the settled population is more peaceful yeah, and, and the migratory <laughs> population is more warlike see uh, you have a settled Settled and peaceful means you have a settled economy. Yes. You are settled about your livelihood. There is no threat because mm. you are following the same pattern of livelihood, cultivation. Stability. Yeah, stability. Yes. But those who are moving, they are in search of stability. Mm. Right. Or maybe just in search of, search of moving all the time. Moving all the time. That mm. can also happen. Mm. So uh, if some land reform act is initiated mm. and a strict law are maintained, to differentiate it between, to differentiate the uh, uh, land that can be settled and the land that should be protected forest. Mm -hmm. This has not been properly maintained by the government of Manipur. Mm -hmm. Whoever is in power, I'm not talking of this or that party, this has not been done enough. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the political leaders, and we keep on blaming the political leaders more, but what about the bureaucracy? They are the ones who are doing top to bottom. And this is not only Nagas or Kuki's mis mischief. Bureaucracy comprises of every community. But we have failed there. We have, we should have, the state should have clearly demarcated the land that can be settled and the land sh that should be protected. And the present government, which they try to do, though very lately. That's what sparked everything off. So we'll come to that. So we have established that we have Metis, we have we have established who are the Metis, who are the Nagas, who are the Kukis. They are mainly living in Burma and they're coming from across Burma. Now, Manipur obviously is a very ancient kingdom. It was much larger at various points in time than what it is today. And you had very powerful kings. So I want to now understand what led to the loss of sovereignty of Manipur. Yeah. See, um, Metis are also... Uh, Though today you can't see that much, but they are very martial race. Yeah. So that not only they consolidated themselves through warfare among the tribes, as I told you, consolidation of the name Maite itself is from warfare and also from matrimonial alliances between different 
ethnicity, ethnic groups within the valley. Mm -hmm. And many those who are in the periphery of the hills were also merged. And it is quite obvious that when the kingdom is expanding its mm -hmm. glory, so they want to conquer more and more. Mm -hmm. And that is what has happened that Maitei is conquered. And it went up to Mandalay. Yes, Mandalay. So Maitei's warfare of Arambai. Now this Arambai Tengul, the name is basically coming from an ancient war that you must have not seen it. The the you can throw that small spear uh, yes, with, with peacock, spear, peacock, yeah, peacock feathers. Feather. Yes. And uh, you you use our uh, pony, the small horse that you don't call it horse, but pony. small size horse. It's very similar to the Mongolian horse. Yeah. Yeah. Now you don't tell that it is we are migrated no, from the Mongolia. I'm just saying it the horse. It's quite possible also. You don't know. I mean, we are not anyone to no, say. No, Mongolia that. came after Manipur. <laughs> Chinggis Khan was the 13th century AD. Mongolia, Absolutely. Manipur was uh, 2000 years ago. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so these horses they used uh, in the bamboo uh, crafted, what do you call, wrapped mm -hmm. through Ningti to rail, they would take the ponies, our warriors, mm -hmm. in small groups would attack the villages there, even went up to the Mandalay. Mandalay in Burma, Burma, the ancient capital of yes. Burma. Yes, the northern side, right? And they have a very interesting fort, which is very similar to Kangla. Yeah, yeah. So this attack and also bringing the ransom mm. has been happening quite some time. Okay. I mean, when your economy is dwindling, you go and do some kind of, uh, this is what the Muhammad bin uh, Ghori have done to India. Somnath was how many times raided. So, to the fairness of history, this is how the Maitis uh, consolidated that power. That's how it happened. So, there's no need to apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> but then what happened was, Ayang, uh, Alang Poya dynasty mm -hmm. consolidated power in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think, in uh, 18th century mm -hmm. that they attacked Manipur. And did they sense some kind of weakness in Manipur that they chose to attack at that time? Yeah, there was divide within the Maiti. The Moirang province was against the Maitis. Okay. Moirangs today, what symbolizes the culture of the Manipur is Moirang. Hmm. The the lifeline, uh, I would say not the lifeline, but uh, what you call the cultural life world of the Moirang hmm. is seen shown as Maiti's worldview. Okay the folklore, the songs, the tradition, the literature. So these communities resisted being part of the Maitis for a very long time. Okay. So they were in touch with the Burmese. So there were internal crisis and that led for the, to the Burmese attacking money. And there was also a succession struggle, right? Yes. King Bhagavad Chandra had died and he did not specify which of his sons should be the next so, king. Yeah, so his yeah. sons were fighting, fighting each other. Among, so one goes to the, this is how it has happened with the British also, mm, yes. with Tekken Rizit. And this has been the story elsewhere. So the Burmese sense weakness yes. and then make their move. Yes. So it's the beginning of the 19th century, is it? Yeah. Okay. It was in 1826 was the Yandabu Treaty, right? Uh -huh. So before that, seven years they were stationed somewhere, 17, uh, 1817 or some, somewhere. Yeah. So the Burmese conquer and occupy Manipur occupy for seven years. Seven years. I think that is the time when Maitei's power, Manipur's power started dwindling. So that's the beginning of the downfall. Down, I would put it like that. Okay. So then what happens? Well, uh, after that, some of the princes, hmm. like Hira Chandra is still well, well known. They were into the gorilla warfare. Okay. So they remained in the hills, in the valley. And they took shelter to the Naga villages even. Mm -hmm. Some says they settled in Paiti villages. The Paitis claim that they used to come. But okay. how true, I do not know. Mm -hmm. But then they were into gorilla warfare to fight the Burmese. Okay. Then the another prince called Prince Gambhir Singh. Mm -hmm and who became a great patriot, went to the British and seek their support. There we go. Yeah. Okay. And the British needed some political forces, military forces who can do the job for them. Okay. To be in the front line, mm -hmm. to have their expansion. Mm -hmm. So they had eyes over Burma and the Burma as an empire and British India as an empire in between is Manipur. Yeah, this Manipur. So, okay. so Manipur was useful for them. It's a stepping stone for them. Absolutely. Hmm. So, so at that time, the British were 
in power in essentially Bengal, right? Bengal it was. Right, okay. So basically he went to the Bengal, Kasar, hmm. Silsar, uh -huh. and uh, six support of the British. Okay, Gambir Singh. Gambir Singh. Okay. And uh, Gambir Singh had to do many activities for British. Hmm. Of course, which was also helpful to Manipur. Okay. For instance, uh, my uh, reading is that what do you call Gauhati Silong, this road. Uh -huh. Gambhir Singh was also mainly responsible for constructing this road. Okay. So many Maitais went to the service, but with the hope of a military support from the British right. to expel the Burmese from the Imphal Valley. Mm. And uh, even Angami villages, mm. they were also had a feud with Maitai kings. Okay, they are now Nagas, right? Yeah. yeah. British wanted a cartable road from Moray mm. because that is a that is how and to Dimapur. To Dimapur. More to Dimapur. More to Dimapur. So this cartable road is what they wanted. This mm. happened a little later. Okay. Uh, and they wanted the help of the Maharaja okay. to do this. So this is after Manipur's king is back in power in Manipur. Back in power. In okay. Manipur. After the Treaty of Yandabo, 1826. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, what I'm saying is uh, British support, hmm. even before the Treaty of Yandabo, hmm. to the Maite king started. Hmm. And I would say that is already beginning of the going down of the Maite power. Gradual loss, Gradual of, sovereignty. loss of sovereignty. Right. So when after the treaty. So what was this treaty of Yandava? Between who was it? This is an interesting part hmm. is Gambhir Singh was fighting the battle in the front. Hmm. Right. But when the treaty took place, it was between the British and the Burmese. The so Manipur king was out of the treaty. Hmm. And this shocked uh, uh, Gambhir Singh. Hmm. And one another reason that has been told is that what you called uh, Kabo Valley, mm. which is now in Burma. Now in Burma. It is under the control of the mighty king. Yeah. But this was, it was not giving up. It was like this, that it will be used by the Burmese and the king will be compensated for this use. That means there is a recognition by the Burmese empire, emperor, that this land is basically Maitai land. They are leasing it. Leasing it. Leasing it. A compensation. Which our Prime Minister Nehru. The great Mr. Nehruji. <laughs> yes, he just gave it away. Gave away. Yes. So you can see that slowly British intervention happened. Hmm. Yeah. So that's the Treaty of Yandabo between the British and the Burmese. Right. Bypassing Manipur. Manipur. So, so then Gambhir Singh comes back to power. Yeah. And then the process continues. But there is now a British political agent. That, that is a point where elsewhere in India you found this. Yeah, same thing. Every, every, same pattern. thing what was happening after 1757, slowly you come up, right? <laughs> yes. Until the 1858, if I'm not mistaken, what is that? Uh, Queen's, Queen's proclamation that comes. Okay. 1858. 58. I believe, yeah. Hmm. So all that was, what was happening was British East India companies, some kind of an agent will be stationed in the court of every king. And there will medal. Medal. That exactly happened in Manipur. Mm. And this happened in 1891. Very, uh, sorry, after this uh, 1826. Yes. Uh, it continued. But after Queen's proclamation, it was that the British monarch is directly, Queen is directly going to control. Yes. But still they are meddling in Manipur in the late 19th century continued. So it all comes to a head in 1891. But before we come to 1891, the meddling starts around 1826 with yeah. the Treaty of Yandabo. Yeah. Now, what do the British do to the demographics of Manipur slowly in the 19th century? This is a very interesting point that you have raised. Uh, first thing they did was uh, to slowly in ensure their own control over mm. this. The king is there, but they have an eye for the hilly areas and also to control these areas. Mm -hmm. The economic resources, this was also their interest. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were already tussle between Nagas and the Maitai kings, mm -hmm. the Naga villages and Maitai king. So uh, the story goes that sometimes the Maitai king invades if they do not give tribute mm -hmm. or sometimes it is also said that some Naga villages attack 
and take away the harvested, you know, grains and so on. So then you have military expedition and so on. But at certain point, British realize that in order to control and balance, you need a third force to be in the buffer zone. Here we begin. Here it goes. <laughs> okay. So what you call today by the government of India as a buffer zone, mm. which is a war situation like in Gaza or somewhere else in mm. Israel. Mm -hmm. So you are also talking about buffer zone. But this was something that British already did, bringing the cookie settlement Where? So from Myanmar to all across the hills around the valley. You want to settle the cookies so that to control the Nagas, they have to put somebody, some other communities that will block the, the kingdom in the valley. That was uh, the ploy of the, uh, the British. So they start settling these outsiders, foreigners, in around the, the valley region, right. especially to the south, right? Yeah, but in the north side also, like Kangpopi and other areas, mm -hmm. there has been settlement. And mm -hmm. now it is a very strong consolidation of cookies in northern part. So the British begin this process in the 19th century. I'm sure it was slow and gradual initially, right? Right. right. So then you, so we have the beginnings of foreign infiltration and occupation in Manipur done by the British to weaken the Metes and the Nagas and, and create a different kind of balance. In, in the in the territory. Now, what happened in 1891? Again, the same story as, as you have seen after Bhagya Chandra, what happened? Mm -hmm. The the family feud, who will become king mm -hmm. after Chandra Kirti, right? Okay. Whether Sur Chandra should become or Kula Chandra will become, there are kings have many wives mm -hmm. and children of different wives, different mothers, and uh, then alliance among the cousins, so brothers. So all this happened. And uh, uh, the one group was Surchandra and Pakasana. Mm -hmm. And another group is Kula Chandra and Tekken Rajit. Okay. But somehow in this feud, uh, Kula Chandra and Tekken Rajit won. Okay. They took over mm -hmm. uh, somehow by military force, okay. to say, mm -hmm. they are without much bloodshed. Okay. But Surchandra went to the British mm -hmm. and six support of the British too. Uh, to support give his claim him, to the him, throne. Yeah, yeah, to retain his throne. Okay. And that led to many issues of British interventions. Okay. Now, in 1891, when uh, they came, already there was a political agent. Yes. Right? It was already there, there and meddling all to this. Whole was issue. it Mr. Grimwood at the time? Grimwood was the one mm. at that point. Uh, I think that uh, from Assam Commissioner, mm. Quinton, Mr. Quinton came, five of them. Uh, they came for a friendly tr discussion, mm -hmm. but subsequently their plan was it's a weak kingdom, so they can, uh, you know, capture this, the Jubras, mm -hmm. the Tekken Rizit, and then the things will be over. So they can annex the kingdom. Annex the kingdom. Okay. Or give it back, whatever their plan Put is. a puppet in place or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. All the five British officers were killed. Okay. But that was very hastily done as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is how the Anglo-Manipuri war began. Okay. Uh, they were killed, beheaded in front of the Kanglasa. Okay. The, the state emblem of a very imaginary, what do you call, animal. Mm. But that was again destroyed by the British. The blew it up. Blew it up. Mm. Uh, that is all the story that was. But what is more interesting after post-1891, mm is that the lineage that was fighting over, Karta lineage, they were fighting over the throne. None of them were picked up. Naturally, they will bring somebody else. So they it. did from a Narasimha's dynasty. Mm. There was one cousin of uh, Gambhir Singh, Narasimha. He, is, he was an honest king to some extent. Uh, his lineage was taken up, Surachan Maharaj. So the British won, they defeated Manipur in 1891 and they placed, a, a, let's say, a subsidiary lineage. Yes. A king from a subsidiary lineage. And very young. Power. Very young guy. He was a boy, right? He was a boy. He was taught in the Mayo College in, I think, school in uh, Rajasthan, I'm told. Mm. Okay. So they ensured that they are in control by proxies. Yes. Right. So he was Europeanized in a way. 
right right, right. so that's where the full british uh, presence is established in manipur right. they are in complete right. control right. now right and then what is done to the demographics after this point that is a very very significant point is before the demographic which has been happening hmm. for quite some time hmm. because during the narasimha's time the demographic change the kuki settlement was happening with the help of the british hmm. so that is before 189 1820s you know that is happening but uh what has happened is after post 1891 hmm. when this young boy was put up as a king hmm. and the british political agent was supervising right hmm. agent he was looking after in the name of the boy king right the governance of the kingdom was reduced largely to the valley that is the first point. major change that is what the cookies are saying hmm. maitis only rule the valley not the hills hmm. but this is a post 1891 phenomenon okay. created by the british okay so the 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 sovereignty remains only in 6% of the land after 1891 yeah of the king in the in the sense that no king hills was also it's not that theoretically it wasn't uh-huh. because there is a, a official called lambu hmm? is a manipuri name lambu and this will go to the hills and also collect uh, annual you know taxes and all that so it is not that maithi king does not have but the kind of governance they wanted to divide the valley from the hills mm-hmm. and hills coming directly under the british directly under the british not under the king that is what they wanted okay in principle the king is the ruler of the entire manipur nominally nominally but in practice what was happening is uh the christianity for instance this is an interesting point please please elaborate the, the, the first community the british tried with the help of the missionaries hmm. was the mighty to be converted to the they, i'm sure did not work failed miserably they, they failed yeah because they wanted all this to live up their vaishnava ethos and become christian that didn't work so then they changed their plan the first community they tried after that in mm. the hills is are the tankus there we go mm. so the tankus were baptized and subsequently maos mara the entire hill was slowly evangelized mm. and uh, if you look at two groups of christianization took place one was the american baptist another is presbyterian wells presbyterian mm. which is coming from silong side mm. from mizoram and subsequently to the lusai hills one coming from kohima from the north mm. so it's like an invasion in one sense mm. that you you slowly evangelize the hill communities and king had no control over no control this. lost all control yeah so they are evangelizing the hills which is the nagas at the same time they are bringing in more cookies right they, they this continued mm. after so, 1891 1891 the mm. in, the coming of the cookies in batches happened even post independence mm. in 49 it happened in 60s it happened in 74 75 it happened 90s it happened in bulk there is lots of documents are available now yeah we'll come to that so the british until 1947 brought in lots of cookies they evangelized the hills and these cookies who came and settled in mainly in the south uh, men they yes. they displaced the the nagas who were living there right was so, there, yes. was there any clashes between the cookies and the nagas in the south we did not hear about that there okay. could be but uh, i i am not aware at because yet. if you are living there and somebody must comes be, and well, must be something's going to happen like in 19 for instance uh, in 1971 mm-hmm. census uh in churachandpur district for instance i'm coming very late mm-hmm. but um, we will go back again mm-hmm. but in 71 maitis were the third largest if i'm not mistaken population in churachandpur third largest yeah a minority there already there is no maithi is left okay in 70 minutes self in churachandpur mm. they have completely displaced destroyed the houses But today old. we know yeah today there are none left there is none left yes so imagine from 71 mm. to eight, uh, 2000 uh, 23 it's well the term is ethnic cleansing i believe absolutely there is what is what else it could be other than ethnic cleansing there is no maithi is left there mm-hmm. yeah. right so we'll backtrack a little yeah. so what happens in 1949 The Indians think of 1947, but in Manipur it's 49. What happens there? Yeah, see, it, when British left, Manipur also was made 
uh, a kingdom, mm. right? It, it retained its own kingdom. Mm. Uh, it was sovereign once again. Mm. But uh, during this 47, 14 August and uh, October 1949, uh, there was an experiment done by the political leaders of Manipur. A new constitution. New constitution yes. under the king. Very interesting constitution. Very interesting. And uh, there, some of them were educated, mm. Bengali, English educated people. They had tr education in either Dhaka, Kolkata, Silet. These were the places they went and studied. Mm. And then schools were coming up in Manipur, Johnstone School and right. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, they tried to have somehow equitable political representation in the line of ethnicity. Okay. So, uh, majority Sins are Maitais, and in their idea, Maitai Pangals, Manipur Muslims, were they put outside because of the religious difference. So, the Hindu, Vaishnavs, and the Sanamahis are put as one. Mm -hmm. So, they had around five representations. The Muslim Maitai Pangal had one. Nagas were included. Cookies were included. So every representation took place. And Dorbar was run by a representative in ethnic line. And that with the constitution, it was tried. Adult franchise, universal adult franchise mm. in Visas. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, when Manipur was merged uh, to Indian uh, Union, Union yeah. that point uh, in October, uh, it was reduced from that status of imagining an independent, you know, country to a part C state of uh, India, not even union territory or a state, a part C state ruled by a commissioner. Mm. So like it is back to 1891 mm. where a commissioner ruled. Mm -hmm. uh, so legislative powers of the people of Manipur lost mm -hmm. in that process. Okay. Yeah. So the, the, it's very clear the Nehruvian regime, the government, had no understanding of the Far East of India. I call it Far East. Everyone says North East. It's Far East actually. So they had no understanding of the region mm -hmm. and, and the history. So I believe they continued the same practices the British had, right? Yeah. I mean, I would say even worse than that in at one point. Worse mm -hmm. in the sense that... Uh, It was a statement of then Home Minister of India to mm -hmm. say that was is there no brigadier in Assam? Mm -hmm. That is to say that if the king is resisting to sign the treaties, use military might. Mm -hmm. That was the one that new India, who was imagining freedom of all, uh, could speak like that. Very unfortunate, but perhaps that is a part of history. But subsequently, what happened? was Congress government in the center debarred mainland Indians to go to the Northeast. The inner line permit inner system. Line permit system. Mm -hmm. And with the argument that these are indigenous tribal population, they should not be meddled, their lifestyle should not be meddled with. But missionaries but were allowed. Missionaries were, it was a free game for the missionaries. The Presbyterians and Baptists continued. Fascinating. And the entire of the, the sifting into Christian population, majority happened after independence. Mm, exactly. Precisely. This is something It, very it happened mainly after India's independence. Yes. So people don't know. This is, this is erasure of culture. Absolute. Absolute devastation of culture. Nothing left. I have done, you know, I have done a study from Indira Gandhi National Center for Arts. Mm. And uh, when I went to the Angami Nagas and others, they still have a memory. Okay. But when they talk about the ethical values, traditional ethical values, Christian values comes very close because you have lived for 100, 200 years, 300 years like that. So your indigenous worldview is somehow mingled with the Christian uh, ethical values and so on. Uh, in case of Kuki Chin groups, with which I have tried to, Thadals I have tried, many of them uh, do not talk of their cultural values anymore. They have totally lost they have, that. They have lost. Okay. They, they only talk about INPI. Now, in Kuki INPI is a political uh, civil society groups, a very modern in, in, in structure. Okay. 
you are using the traditional name, uh -huh. but your practices, their rituals, the activities they do is very modern. Mm. So that traditional values, I believe, are uh, not to be found much. Okay. So I believe that around in the 1901 census, uh, cookies were still about 1% of the population of That Malibu? is what has been uh, said. Yeah. And when what happens in 61, 71, what was the percentage? Suddenly is jumping into how, how much was that? In 20s or I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not remembering exactly. Yeah. 20% plus. Some, something that, that yeah. That Significant is. rise of the population. Now, why was it that after India's independence and after Manipur's merger in 1949, why was the government of India still bringing in cookies? In fact, I would put it like this, uh, not blaming the government per se, but movement of the peoples were happening. Mm -hmm. Earlier also it was happening. They were allowed to come in. Okay. Sometimes the British is allowing settlement. Uh -huh. Manipur king, Maitai king was also allowing settlement at a certain point. Okay. But then after India's independence with the development pace that was slowly building up in the northeast. Uh -huh. I mean, you might say today the pace of development is more in the last 10 years, but it was happening since 47, 49. Mm -hmm. So, but it was not happening in the other side of the border. East of the border. Yeah. So it is a human nature. Where is the greener pasture? They will come. Okay. But I believe that we were bringing in refugees, apparently, refugees. Un unfortunately, in the 60s, I have the record with me. Uh, maybe I have to show you later on. Uh, the the Kuki Paite groups who have come and settled down, who were in 67, they, there is a government record how in which part of district of Churachanpur they were settled. And subsequently, they are requesting monetary support for the refugees. <laughs> and subsequently, they also became settled tribe, given settled tribe status. Foreigners come in as refugees and they get privileges. Yes, then oh. ST, then you get the, into the government jobs. And that is the grudge of many Maitis are saying, what the hell are we doing? Are we, because of the Hinduism that we have embraced, we remain in the mm. upper strata and we clearly, are losing clearly. Yeah. Now, something happens in the 1960s or something, if I'm not mistaken. There is an act which is passed in Manipur, which kind of officializes the fact that Metis can only stay in 6% of the land. This, I am not very sure. I, I will not be in a position to tell you very clearly. Mm -hmm. But it is true that Maitis were slowly being put into the valley area. Only the valley area. In the valley area. They can't purchase land outside the that, valley. That, that is, uh, somehow it is not a... Pre it, it is happening in Churachanpur, they could. But I have not come across. There is mixed of stories. Uh -huh. I have heard many says that we uh, Maitis are not stopped, but they don't go. Like it's like you can technically purchase land, but you have to take the the local permission, chief's local, permission. Then, then, and then how, obviously how that's not going to happen, right? Yeah. Where is in the valley? Anyone can come. Anyone can anyone, come and purchase land Indians, in the valley. Any Indians yeah. can come. And but purchase. Maitis cannot purchase land outside the valley. I mean, isn't this the definition of apartheid? This is somewhat uh, in your own state. You are uh, stuck into the. You are a second class citizen. Absolutely. You are you are put in a in a cage. Absolutely. And this is, I think that that act is still in in, in force. Well, uh, it is, but there was again a worse addition to this act. Okay. That was, and this present government has uh, removed that. Okay. And what that addition is that once a tribal. And that is from non maitai Naga, Kuki, or uh, other tribes. Mm -hmm. If they purchase a land in the valley mm -hmm. from a Maitai, mm -hmm. it becomes a tribal land. Good God, even to that extent. So once you sell it off, no other Maitais can buy that land. I mean, what sort so, of... So your 6% was again further reduced. So... Present government has removed that clause. I see. Uh, calling it as a tribal land property. I see. This is incredible. I mean, th that this happens in post-independence India is incredible. We are legislating such things. Now, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, there was insurgency across the Northeast. What was the cause? Why, why was insurgency uh, erupting out of every state? Mizoram, Assam, Manipur, Meghalaya, Nagaland, everywhere insurgency. What was the, what was going on? 
I would put it like this. There could be different uh, narratives, but one narrative which I strongly believe and is the case is Naga insurgency is the mother of all insurgency in the region, uh, primarily because uh, while in Manipur, this is also very divided. The merger of Manipur to India, there are two groups of people. Some who did not want to be part of India and felt that it was annexation. It is not a merger. But there were also sizable number of Congress political activists uh, who wanted to be part of India, who also were part of the freedom struggle that movement they wanted to be. So it is a divided view, but these are now the majority of the voices are that we were uh, not, it was merged, but annexed. This is a different narrative. So why I brought this first is in 49, which happened later, uh, Maitais were mixed. The majority did not like, but there were sizable number who wanted to be part of India. I'm making it second time to make it strong. Where is in case of Nagaland, mm -hmm. Naga Hills? There was no Nagaland that point. In yes. Place. It yes. was Assam. Assam, yes. So you have only Tripura, Assam and Manipur. Mm -hmm. Manipur was a kingdom. Tripura was a kingdom and Assam and then North East Frontier Agency. Nefa. Nefa. Which is now Arunachal Pradesh. Yes. So this is where one was. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Naga Hills, they did not want to merge with India. And this happened from the time of Simon Commission. Uh, NNC under Fijo, he even met Gandhiji and pleaded that Nagas be free from being merged to so India. NNC is Naga National Council? Yes. Okay. Naga National and Council. And their leader was Fijo? Fijo. Okay. And Gandhi, I am told, is my, I interviewed some of the Angami leaders. Gandhi was supposed to have told them that it is your own. He is a principled person. He says it is up to you. It is your decision how you. But how it happened was in 1947, uh, Nagaland also became, this Naga Hills also became part of India. And the whole crisis started. They went up into arms and so on. And this continued up to 70s. If you remember that Silong Accord, which happened between the NNC and the government of India. And then some of the Nagas break away, did not approve of this. And the, the go eastwards? NSCN was formed, okay. right? National mm -hmm. Council of Nagalim mm -hmm. by a Tankul Naga from Manipur. How interesting. I said uh, Muiva. Muiva. Th Muiva. Mm. So the, if you see that Naga insurgency movement going against their desire uh, to be away from India, so fighting against the Indian state uh, for their own aspirations, so to call it has been a very long. Now they have come to the point that they are into the table discussing modalities to be part of India, yet the closest, the how they exist and they manage their self-determination, right? But subsequently, Mizoram also happened. Mizoram was terrible, wasn't terrible. it? Indira Gandhi had to bomb Mizoram. Yes. With, with uh, the Air Force. Many, many try to refuse this, hmm. but it was the only a state in the entire Northeast where Indian Air Force bombed. Mm, yes, uh, Aizol was bombed. Aizol was bombed. Yes, 66. I, I think. Yes. They seized the city for some time. Mm. It, they declared independence, mm. MNF, mm. Mizo National Front. Mizo National Front. But if you look at MNF, their emergence was not from their aspiration to be independent of India. Okay. Unlike the Nagas. Uh -huh. There was a famine, famine that happened. Mautam famine. Yes. Yes. And the, what you said, indifference of the center mm. towards what was happening in the Northeast. I mean, too little perhaps has been done. And Mijo felt that uh, they have no point to be part of India. This is how they are to be treated. So they wanted, and this MNF has a longer name. It was initially a civil society group. 
which took up arms later on to become independent. The question India. is, where do these arms come from? See, you have in case of major arms, it's very clear. I had the opportunity to talk to some of them, interview them. Uh, East Pakistan and West Pakistan, Bangladesh creation, 70s, these were already happening. And uh, uh, some of them even took help from, uh, see, the, the politics that was happening, the international politics in the region mm -hmm. of then East Pakistan, mm -hmm. India's intervention into that. 71. Obvious, 71. Yes. And then subsequently, prior to that, the uh, Pakistani government instigating this disenchanted uh, tribal leaders to fight against the Indian regime is quite mm -hmm. obvious. Mm -hmm. So their helping of arms to the Mijos is well known. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Nagas, their support that they got from the Chinese government is quite well known. Mm -hmm. Many of them were trained in Lhasa. Mm -hmm. Even Manipur's uh, PLA's leaders, mm -hmm. they were all trained in Asa, uh, okay. Lhasa. Lhasa. Mm -hmm. But I'll come to Manipur a little later. There is a very complex uh, link mm -hmm. between Naga movement and Meitei Manipur resurgence. Mm -hmm. And it comes from a contradiction. Okay. So people might say that, oh, they are all nationalist movement. Mm -hmm. So Manipur's emergence is out of something else. Uh, when the Nagas fought the Indians and it continued and uh, several things were internal crisis was happening among the Nagas as well. Uh, many Nagas leaders were assassinated within. Uh, but in 70s, uh, Silong Accord was held, the treaty was arrived at to end this uh, impasse, mm -hmm. the crisis. But then, as I said, the Naga, uh, young Naga leaders from Manipur led by uh, Muiva uh, took up arms again and continued, did not uh, agree with the NN, uh, this Silong Accord and that continued. So all this help they were getting from the Chinese. That is for sure, for arms. Mm -hmm. But if you allow me, then I can continue to do. <clears throat> now, the next point is, if you are seeking for your sovereignty, self-determination, you will not do in vacuum. Mm -hmm. You will need a territory. Mm -hmm. So Nagas were carving out their land where they say this will be our territory as a Nagalim. Nagalim. Yeah. So, not only the present Nagaland, but some areas of Tirap and Changlang in Arunachal Pradesh, where some of the Nagas inhabit there, they also wanted that part to be part of, because they say it is a contiguous area, continuity of Naga settlement from present Nagaland to the north, to Arunachal Pradesh, two districts. So, Tirap and Changlang is wanted to be part of Nagalim. What else did they want as part in of Nagalim? South, mm. you have the entire Senapati districts and Ukru to be part of, and also Chandel and others. So, like the northern half of Nagalim? Northern half of More than half. More than half. <coughs> what else did they want? Well, they, they want it as a separate, uh, what you call, country. Okay. Now, that has not materialized. They know that. So long they have been fighting. So there has been ceasefire agreement in 1997. They were starting to have and continuing. It. And then they had a framework agreement after decades again. So nothing really is coming out. But what I'll come to that later. But what happened in 60s and 70s that suddenly valley young peoples took up arms. Yeah. First was the UNLF, then comes the PLA and their political wing RGM. UNLF is a political organization, their military wing is MPA. So this happened in 60s and 70s, way decades after the Naga insurgency happened. Why? Now the point was Manipur was an independent sovereign kingdom, they believe. Even after British left, 
So 47 to 49, we were independent. We tried our own constitution. It was a kingdom led by Buddha Chandra Maharaj. And the, the government was representative of all the ethnic communities. Did they try to experiment? How successful? I can't say. <clears throat> but an attempt was made towards a multicultural form of governance, right? A multicultural state, kingdom or a state, you call it country. But after submission or what you call merger to India in 49, subsequently all the legislative powers were curtailed. It was not even union territory. It was a part C state. Now, people, political representations were going to make it a state and so on. In 70s, 60s, there were. Whereas in 1963, Nagaland state was created mm -hmm. because government of India want to contain the Naga NNCs. So you create a state out of Assam, this entire Naga hills, to carve out the Naga land. So Maitis felt that our whole effort of peaceful democratic means to become a state, because it was a kingdom, we had our own culture, history. But Manipur was made uh, at the same time only a union territory. But Nagaland became a state. Nagaland became a state. So this was what was what was a very painful experience of the people that this peaceful democratic means of engagement doesn't help. And this is our rightful claim that something we have been, we are not claiming that status of an independence, but as a state, that should be given in Indian in territory. So the point, the question that come is, do we need to take up arms to threaten the Indian sovereignty? Then only will India is here. This is one. Second is the NSCN started, NNC already, that point in 60s. Imagine this Nagaland and this Naga expansion of northern part of Manipur to be part of Nagaland mm -hmm. was giving a threat to the Manipur political leaders and intelligentsia and youths. Okay. So people who were middle class, and also educated young people felt that this is a threat to Manipur's entity existence. So only way to protect this land, because they were not expecting government of India to do much, because they have already seen in the political domain they have lost so much. So they took up arms. Mm. And prior to that, already Pan Mill, uh, Pan Manipur Youth League, uh, this is in the heart of city. And it came up with cultural nationalism. That our own history of an independent kingdom, that should be brought to our memory. Mm -hmm. Relive the memory. Cultural resurgence was tried out by Pan Mill. And from there, slowly UNLF, some of the young people formed this political outfit. And then subsequently, more aggressive ones uh, created this PLA. But very interestingly, PLA, People Liberation Army, is the same name of the China's military. <laughs> so yeah. uh, when it was asked to them, they later on said PLA, Eastern Region. But then still Eastern Region of what? So I won't say any further on that point. Mm. It's a tricky thing. Uh, I know not so much on that field. But what I was trying to tell you is emergence of uh, insurgent movement, arm movement in this region is very, very different. Assam has another. It is in terms of migration of the Bangladeshis, indigenous people being threatened. Yes. They took up, they, they had to take up arms for that, mm. for an independent uh, Assam. Mm. The Nagas, right from the day one, I said they were never wanting to be part of it. From 1920s, they had been fighting it. Mm -hmm. But Manipur's going up with arms was primarily out of the fear of loss of territory. And that fear still is continuing to be. Right. So 
they took up arms because Manipur did not get what Nagaland got, state, the status of a state. But Manipur eventually did become a state, but the insurgency continued. It became in 71. Hmm. But then when you give the post date a check, this hmm. is often people say, when they wanted, you did not. So only when the things went bad, then you give something less. And what more can government of India give beyond the statehood? And it's very, quite understandable. But the youth who are already charged with continued mm -hmm. with their dreams and aspirations. Hopefully now they will understand that perhaps it is good for Manipur to be part of India. So all the other insurgencies in some shape or form eventually were pacified. They died down. There was a Mizo Accord. There was a Naga thing and so, and so on and so forth. But Manipur kept on burning and burning and burning. And Manipur was declared a disturbed area or something in 58 or something. Yeah, it and it's, it, it, it continued for decades. Are, still, there are areas under Afsa. So, why did Manipur get this special treatment? And why did Manipur keep on burning? Why, was there a religious angle here? All the other states were Christianized by this time. Manipur was the only place where you had Hindus left. Uh, I'm not that sure about that, but it is a different phenomenon Manipur has been. Hmm. If you look at all the insurgent movements, somewhere... Agreement has come across. Yes. Assam is a Hindu state. I mean, yeah, true, true. So, yes. so they have come into, but somewhere, mm -hmm. Maitis are very hard not to crack. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just tell uh, something very interesting. Lieutenant General Himalaya says that Maitis are so uh, suspicious of the other. So you can never trust a Maiti or they will never trust you. It takes time for them to trust people. Uh, Maybe because of the historical experiences it had. And also somewhere in the memory, uh, they're having once a martial race, a kingdom who governed themselves and also other reasons. Unlike, uh, let's say, uh, Nagaland. Yeah, I, I, will, I will not go to that. I will go there. <laughs> yeah, I'll go there. I will not say that. But I think that historical memory. Hmm. Still, people seem to carry that. Mm -hmm. Though I'm not in favor of uh, eurozizing that memory. Yes, that memory should retain to sustain ourselves. But if you eurozize that, there is a possibility of coming into tussle with other communities. After all, this is no more a kingdom. You cannot say that Maiti ruled, so we will rule still. It cannot be like that. But the fear <coughs> of losing this territory which they have lost from Treaty of Yandabu. Before that, seven years devastation. Yes. Often after every decade or so, it kept happening. After India's independence, as you have said already, that in 60, some strange land reform act came up, right? Parliament passing strange law act. Is it not also some way of, you know, uh, the gulf, the mistrust being encouraged? Not knowingly, perhaps. I won't say government of India does it knowingly to dismantle the spirit of the Maitis. No. But somewhere, Maite political leadership and intelligentsia has not been able to express out what the community needs to be given. And also government of India and its own political leadership have not understood enough of the Maitis. And to that extent, I would say, we are not Hindus in the same way as the Hindus of Maharashtra or Gujarat or UP. In fact, Hindus are not one. There are multiple ways we follow. And this is the beauty of this Hinduism. Hindutva is a beautiful way that you have your own ways of life. Yet we are connected. And we follow Navadvip Vaishnava tradition of uh, Gauriya Sampradaya of uh, Achinta Vedavi, right? Mm -hmm. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mm -hmm. But we also worship our indigenous religion, mm. our religious deity, Sanam, mm. we still worship. Even the Brahmins who have come here, married the Maitai women, continue to be part of the social fabric, given a status of Brahmins, still worship Sanamahi in the southwestern corner of the house. Every Brahmins worship that. Mm. So it is a very syncretic, experimented tradition where you marry something good coming from outside with something you have already retained, which you think is our forefather ancestral worship. How can you leave that ancestral worship? But when you become Christian, you lose all that up. So I would, through this medium, even tell my, not only the other Indians, by 
own fellow Maitais that please do not see contradictions between Manipuri Vaisnavas and Manipuri Sanamalis. They are very closely complemented. Same tradition. people, same people. Same people. It's, it's a beautifully syncretic kind of culture like we have in Japan, Shinto, yeah. in Buddhism, yeah. same thing. Both practice elements of the other. Yeah. And what's wrong with that? I mean, it makes the thing richer. Look at Bali, look at Indonesia. There also we have Hinduism in, in, in its own form. And I would say form. this is the beauty of Hinduism. Yeah. That it, the, the grand narrative allows smaller other local narratives to mingle. Absolutely. There's and no suppression or smashing no. it out. Yeah. And, and leaves out in its own way yes. the way of life of that community. They all sustain. Correct. That is the beauty of Manipuri Vaishnavism, I would say. Right. So we have this terrible period of insurgency. <clears throat> And in the 90s, something new starts, the Naga Kuki clashes, which was almost like a civil war. What, what happened there? See, the point is that, uh, as we discussed earlier, the nomadic nature of the Kukis, uh, I would request Kuki friends not to take it in the derogatory sense. Nomadic is a way of life, right? It may infilt, uh, create problem for the other, but this is a particular mode of cultivation and way of life. Desirable, non-desirable, that's a different story. So Kukis had been settling in many villages, uh, areas of the Nagas, in the sense that Chenapati district, Ukhru, where Nagas are dominant forces. So they decided, okay, now we're going to settle here. They, they were allowed by the Naga chieftains. The, okay. the Nagas do not, if I'm not mistaken, they do not have chief system anymore. But they have committees, various councils. Which are dominated by some other organization, I'm sure. Well, from time to time, all insurgent groups control all the uh, civil society groups. Mm. But where else they will go? Mm. They will have to listen where the state's presence is minimal. Then the armed groups, diktats, comes into the play. So, so I will not go into that. Yeah, so the cookies start settling in Naga. Yes, yeah. the, that's the point I wanted to make. Mm. Is Once they settle... They had agreement with the Naga village councils that they, they have to give taxes, annual taxes to the Nagas. But when the Kukis increase their number... Then why should we pay taxes? There <laughs> we go. We have numbers. Is, that is how it all started. Mm. That was one. Non-payment of taxes to the Naga villages. They said, now we have for decades, we have, it is ours. So this is the practice of the name. Cookies. Hmm. So after 10 years or 20 years, now it's our then it is our hmm. It's like uh, in, in, if you also are tenant and uh, stay on for 20 years, then Supreme Court may also say. <laughs> <laughs> so who possesses the land? Possession. possession. So they create facts on the ground by possession with the, possessing the territory, establishing villages over there. Yes. And then they say this is our that, land. That, that, that is how it started. That is one reason. Hmm. Another reason is, and very important, is control of the Mori. More. More is trade sensitive area. It's a trading town. Ah. Well, they say it's India's gateway to the to the, to the Eastern Asia, South Asia. Asia. Critical, vital yes, town. Yes, yes. So uh, there were two big Tankul villages nearby. Mm. And uh, what we hear is that prior to 70s, 1970s, in 60s, uh, there was no Kuki villages settlement in More area. Mm. So it was much later. Mm -hmm. So in they slowly came up to 70s, the migration, I told you. And easiest place was Mori is right in the boundary, right? Then you have Nampalong on the other side, little more you have Tamu. So people coming and settling in this side of the border. This it, is this is very allowed. This is very similar to Chinese salami slicing. Slice by slice by slice, you just move inch by inch. Inch by inch. And after two decades or so, they started such. So, a what was the government of India doing? Did the did, did, was the government not concerned about sovereignty? That when you have foreigners coming <clears throat> and settling, and they start claiming the land, I mean, is this not a threat, to, direct challenge to national sovereignty? That, that's what I say. That India never had a proper planning for the North East. Completely marginalized, disregarded place. Yeah. yeah. I mean, till the first five year plans that, you know, second, third, fourth, if you look at, even when you look for Manipur, the planning was you pick up a district of Assam and then calculate and give whatever is to be given. From far away. Uh, never bothered about. Uh -huh. But only when the insurgency started, this is unfortunately, why have 
government of India to react yeah. only when the people took up arms. Hmm. It should have been happening much earlier so that arm movement never comes up. After all, they are citizens of this country. So I keep asking this when I go to Wagha border. The presence of India as a sovereign state and Pakistan is quite visible. It's a dramatic way in which the BSA and their rangers does. And people also see like, you know, the Athenian, uh, sorry, Romans would like gladiators, gladiators doing. Yeah. And all the rituals, but there is a beauty, but also there is a, what you call pride in its sight that this is a country called India. We are strong enough. And I don't see the presence of that India in the Northeast. Mm. Only I see if they are there, not in that way, but to stop unwanted elements, something like that. So the presence of the Indian state, as you see in Punjab or in other Rajasthan, it, you don't see in the Northeast. Mm. That is why even the present regime, it, it was, I think, 2018 that they said, F, uh, FMR, the free movement regime of 16 kilometers this way, that way. Earlier was also there. They were formalizing it only to realize now that that has to be stopped. Because, because the problem is there in the other side of the border. Mm -hmm. Myanmar is a problem. We Myanmar have to seriously look yes. into it. Yes. Yeah. So we have the Naga Kogiri clashes that happened in the 90s. And these were very violent and very widespread clashes, but eventually it was contained. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I went to a little, that, that point you made mm. about the Naga Kuki, I said, one, control for Mori mm -hmm. because of the commercial hub. The next is Kuki migration and settlement and not paying tax. Mm -hmm. And Nagas also realizes that this is not going to be good for the Nagas. Mm. Because if you see Kankukki area, later on is now when the uh, uh, a district is formed. It is Koki dominated. Nagas are minority there. Mm, they become a minority. minority. Which was like they were 100% of the yeah, population. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, it happened almost eight, seven, eight years. Mm. The killings, the massacre. Mm. And most of the Kukis who fled either to Surajanpur said they or to Imphal. The Maitis were the one who tried to settle the Cookies. In their own territory. In the Imphal Valley. Lovely. And now they are getting the prize for that. Hmm. So, Maitis felt that you had been ungrateful the way they all this started. Well, <coughs> that's just the way the world works. So, you have the Naga Cookie clashes in the 1990s. And, and then yes. you... Now we come to the present day situation. I hear that in the past 5-7 years, I don't know, Lacks of cookies have crossed the border and sprung up in villages all over the place? Yeah, that is now, uh, the denial is from the cookie side. But <clears throat> the way things are happening at the moment, the way the populations are increasing, it could be na not through the natural birth. Yes, impossible. Impossible. Mm -hmm. You cannot keep on producing seven, eight children impossible in one or two years. So there is sustained effort to push these populations across the border into India, into Manipur. I would put it like this. Uh, it is not pushing by somebody else. One is it is a pull. Pull. The go India is doing well. It's stable a stable economy. economy. Yeah. Once you come here, you won't die. And you will get privileges. There, status. there is a free food regime. What do you call that? A public distribution system. Mm. BDS is there. You give in a very low scale prices. You get uh, edible oils, the rice, the pulses, right? And subsequently, unfortunately, these people were given citizen voting rights. And later on, after Aadhaar came, the Aadhaar card are given. So then they become settled. They become citizens. They can compete with the people. And then, you know, the migrants are more hardworking. So they, they are mostly cookies are outnumbering the Nagas in the government jobs, all the class one officers today. So that is how things are. And the issue is that there is a much larger cookie population east of the border, international border. Yeah. In in the Chin region and, and other states. Sagang also, yeah. Sagang, Sagang and Chin and all. Yes. So there's a huge pool of them over there. And the border is open because of the free movement regime. And they can just cross over anytime they like. And now it is a civil war-like situation in Burma, right? Yeah. They're fighting the Burmese government. So is that also a factor that's pushing yeah, these people? See, uh, <clears throat> when 
T.S. Hawke wrote this book long back in the 90s, I believe, that uh, Jalen Gaon. So his dream, and we never bothered much about this. We thought, how is it possible? But he sees that the entire Chin province of Bang uh, Myanmar are cookie. Then you have certain section of Bangladesh, Bangladesh. where cookies are settled. Hmm. Even Sagan division, which is next to Manipur, even their cookie settlement. Then you have Mizoram, which are Mijo, but they say they are cookies. Chin, they are cookie Chin Mijo group. Same right? group, yeah. And then you have southern part of Manipur, which is now occupied. Again occupied. Yes. So you dream of a big country. So they are fighting Burma, they are fighting Bangladesh, they are fighting India. They are in fighting a, three in nations. A, in a way, yes. And they in want the to create way, their own nation. This is their dream. Hmm. So after all, see, why do they have to write to the Israel Prime Minister? Hmm. Why do they have to write to the United Nations, not to the New Delhi? So you are looking for forces, powers outside of India. Yes. So that implies that you don't recognize Indian state as a mediator. Hmm. Or you're concerned, you're addressing to something beyond. Right. They yes. want external interference in India's internal Yes, affairs. absolutely. Mm. Uh, that is something the government of India must look at. But having said that, even they know that this place was not theirs, but now they have, they have settled. By any means, they want to hold on to it. Mm. So what they are calling separate administration, either it is in the Union territory or something else, and this is what they are uh, going to ask for. And arms fight conflict will not end because they have to get something. This is what their dream is. Now let's come to the present day situation. So now I think the viewers will have enough understanding to, under to know that this conflict did not erupt out of nowhere. It was hidden under the surface. It just took one spark to set it off. So what happened in May 2023? May 3rd, yeah. May 3rd. See, uh, things has been happening quite a bit, though it is the late understanding of the chief minister at the moment, but nonetheless he understood that in the last, it's not a sudden thing, in the last four or five years. And let me go back a little bit. Look at, uh, I think, 2008, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. So, 2000. So, right? 2008 or 5? Somewhere around that time. I don't remember the year, but yeah. something like that. Uh, this was between Assam Rifles and Kuki Chin groups, militant groups. So what is Su? Suspension of operation. And that is basically the arm of a conflict uh, between these militant groups with Indian defense should be stopped. It should be suspended. So they will not target each other. Okay. So these insurgent groups will be put in some camps, designated camps, next to the Indian forces. Maybe it is BSA, but in most cases, it is Assam Rifles. There is a paramilitary force. It is and not the Indian Army. It's a paramilitary force. But, but commanded by the Indian Army. Okay, sir. Okay. So it is a very quasi-relationship. So it is not a part of the Army, but it is always an Army officer who will have this. And this majority of the Assam Rifles are from the Northeast. So there are Kuki, there are Maite, there are Nagal, there are Nepalese. And I also met some uh, Rajasthanis there. I had a long talk. So uh, in some of the areas where it is inflicted with violence. Now this designated camps of the Kukis, and it is happening with Nagas as well. When ceasefire agreement took place with the Nagas and the uh, government of India, uh, they were given designated camps. Government of India says that this is a place where we should consolidate. Their arms are meant to be uh, put somewhere else. They are not supposed to use, but sometimes they do use. <clears throat> and each terrorist gets a stipend. Somewhere I am told 6,000 and it can go up as ordinary sepoy. So when Naga ceasefire agreement was supposed to come, this is in 2001, way back. The number of recruitment was huge. After all, it comes to the economics, unemployment. So if you join the cadre and part of that ceasefire agreement, part of the suit, ceasefire agreement is with the Nagas, but this is suspension of operation with the cookies and some might take in certain groups. So you get stipend and 6,000 is the minimum stipend you get. So people are into it. Now, the point is, 
they are given designated camp where they have to settle. Even if they have to move out, they have to take permission of the Assam Rifles Office. Their arms are supposed to be under the control or supervision of the uh, Assam Rifles. So this is all the ground rules that are happening. Now, has that been followed? Absolutely not. There we go. So now, the, what has happened was, uh, this during this ceasefire agreement or Sioux operation agreement was signed, somewhere I would say because that there is no confrontation, there is also laxity in the part of the Indian defense forces that nothing really serious is coming. And there the movement of the people increased. And I would not say that it is uh, with a design, but it could be. One could be that the Myanmar itself is under trouble, the military rule. Then you know the pro-democratic PDF uh, was formed by those who believe in democratic movement. They have to take up arms against the military junta. So they have to come to the Indian side. They get settlement from the Kuki militant organization. As if they own the land and they have some Yeah, they were given training. This mm. is what has been said. Mm. Near Moray, there is a specific area village where they were trained and very near to the Assam Rifles as well. So the whole point was because of the compulsion that is happening in Myanmar, people are migrating. Number two, because of the greener pasture, economic life, life is much better in India. So anyone from that outside of the border would like to come. And third, which is very serious, is that because many, unlike Mizoram, in case of Mizoram, when they are allowing the cookies to come, the chin, yes, they have yes, designated camp. Right? You must have noticed. Let's briefly right? talk about the role of Mizoram in all this. Yeah. So yeah. let me just bring and see how different it is between Manipur and Mizoram. So they are also entering Mizoram, but they are not settling in Mizoram. In, yes, they are. First, they allow them to be in designated camps. Government of Mizoram allowed. Mm. Give them some cards, mm. number, that they are outsiders. They are not given Aadhaar card. Because once you get Aadhaar card, they will have access to PDF system, which Mizos don't want. So they are saying that we are doing humanitarian role, allowing you to come. Basic help you are, we are giving, but you are not part of us. Mizoram government says there are nearly 40,000 Chin. But Mizoram. does the Mizoram government have the authority to decide That's who comes into the that nation? That is the strange thing. It's the, the Indian government, government that decides the movement of foreigners. Right? Uh, not the state yes, government. So the state government haven't had the cheek to say you cannot fence. But they are doing this. Who are they? But still they are doing it. And, and the government of India is not saying much on to this. And what's more is that now those people are being routed into Manipur. This is one story hmm. that many are coming somewhere even caught in the Imphal airport when they somehow the physical feature and all did not resemble with the original uh, uh, older cookies even other cookies. They, they were asked and they produced Aadhaar card and they could not give details of that. So they were detained. But Worst part is, while Mizoram has been able to, I mean, let me not go into the uh, technicalities whether Mizor government can do or not. They cannot, but still they did because they tried to protect their own community, but also the brotherhood, the fraternity also they want to. Now, in case of Manipur, what has happened is many of these Chin people from across the border comes and mingles. And my report says that there is a strong connivance between the cookies who are already settled here with the new cookies who are coming in the last 10 years from 2008 onwards. And one pattern of settlement is, and this is a proof onto it, is that there is a cookie village, which is say like 10 years or 20 years old. So since they have a nomadic character, these people create a village nearby and the old village you allow the newcomers newcomers to settle so mm. that people don't have any doubts. So they will say that we are just settling. So if government officials go there, they will speak, they know the landscape, they know the population demography and so on. So this there has been a ploy in play. Now in the process what is happening is 
two, three prone things, uh, benefits they are getting, the cookie chips. Now, they create a village and all these are subjects of yours. So now, Manrega, that uh, prime ministers, now it is earlier it was Manrega, now it is the PM, uh, Rosgar, you know, that you have 20 days of work you get. So the, the labor you get engaged, the chips siphon them off. Because you open bank account in the name of all this, but one who is operating account is the chip. So more people you gather, more money you get from the government of India, all these schemes. Secondly, they are also voters. Once you get the Aadhaar card prepared, subsequently you will be a voter. And once you are a voter, you have representation, your own, you can contest election. And that is what our Union Home Minister has said, that this opening up of this free movement of regime has led to demographic change. As you have said, the huge increase in population of the cookies. Earlier demographic balancing was, Maiti was the majority, more than 50% they enjoy, nearly 60. Came the Nagas, subsequently the cookies. So now, now the second is the cookie. They are more than the Nagas. So are the Maitis a minority now? Maitis, if you remove the Muslim population and the Christian population. Oh, then they are certainly minority. Then there are massively small minority. Maybe 44, 45 percent. So the 2011 census was, Maitis were what, 30 something, 30 or 40 something percent? I, I don't know, then 40 something. Percent. Now there must be, I think, now it must be very skewed, very lopsided, yeah. I'm sure. If you, if you count, uh, minus the Christian population among the Maitis, who has come more than 2 lakhs hmm. in the last few Decade. That is a shocking change. So what the evangelizing that has, what the British failed in to do with the Maitis, the cookies have succeeded <laughs> to convert. And I have interviewed some of them and some of the Maitis who are uh, embracing Christianity, some are from very poor background. So it, it, there was a financial inducement and all yes. that. Mm. So if you... Uh, Become a Christian, your child will be given free education mm. and a certain monetary benefits. Mm. So after all, economics comes to the mm. picture. Yeah. And the government when doesn't do it. Yeah. So this uh, then the question comes, where is this money coming from? That is the question. That's the government of India must find it out. The money is coming from somewhere. Follow the money. Yes. Yes. Where is this missionaries? So much of money to give everyone. Unlimited money. money. Yes. Unlimited. From where is it? Yeah. What is the agenda? That is something worth looking into. Right. So we have this Sioux Agreement, which has kind of not really worked. It has given these people the cover to continue their operations. And now we have this flare up of violence, which began on in, in early May 2023. So what call, what was the official yeah. yes. excuse for, for yes. rampaging? See, the point was, first thing, I, I one point I missed out was that I can understand the agreement between Nagas and the government of India. But they're indigenous, we, the Nagas. And no, not only that, but they were fighting against the Indian state, mm. right? Mm. So they wanted an independence. The Maitis also died, so Assamese also tried. But Kukis hardly fought against the Indian state. They so, were all armed militia, they were. So then why the special agreement with them? That is something for government of India to find out. Hmm. I will not like to make it very public. Some of the things, you know, I can't say everything out there. But it is for others to find out, my viewers to find out, that Kuki groups, KNA for Kuki National Army, this is not from Indian soil. They are basically Kukis of Myanmar. KNA operationally is a Myanmari organization. Subsequently, they come and they also say now it's a Manipur. Hmm. KNA Manipur, KNA Mizoram, they will say. They're so opening franchises. Franchise, McDonald's. Franchise. Okay. So, but then government of India somehow thought there should be ceasefire agreement. Now the problem is with since the fight is not there in that scale, there has been vested interest of drug traffickers. That's a very important angle. Very and poppy. The, the, the poppy. 
And you know, Maitis basically are nature worshippers. Hinduism is also one. We worship nature. So river is sacrosanct to us. Mountains are sacrosanct. So every mountain hill has a memory, a name of a deity. And this Kauru area, which is a mountain head, and Maitis believe that we initially were settlers of this place. Subsequently, we come down to the valley for greener pasture, water bodies, and so on. We require, but initially we were there as tribes. Now we go annually for worship. There is another place called Thangjing in Churachampur. Again, Thangjing is a name of a god, a deity, mighty god. We are Hindus. We also still worship. So there is a temple of Thangjing in Moira, but also there is a hill where people go uh, often on to worship. Not every day, but some where weekly or something. These were stopped because the migration of population of Cookies in all these hills, which were otherwise greeneries, full of greeneries, uh, were cut down. Settlement came up. Entire forest ranges in Kanpoki and many in Senapati are completely uprooted, totally destroyed, and poppy cultivation. Poppy cultivation. Now. That is how it all started. And when this government, present government, tried to stop this cultivation and two, the check the illegal migrants, the entire crisis started. Though cookies are arguing that uh, the 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 crisis that came up, uh, I'm forgetting this J a village. Uh, I have it in my. Yeah. Uh, notebook from where the whole crisis started, violence erupted. Was a settlement, they say, government of Manipur has approved some 10 years back. But government says no, the final approval has not been given, but they were considering it. And they found that this village was built in reserved areas. So people were unscrupulous. But then the problem is, I must also tell you that government machineries have been very ineffective. Yes. The small times officers, corrupt officers, have just managed to have the paperwork. That's the story of India. I mean, look at the Bangladeshi infiltration in India. Absolutely. Who's doing that? Who is allowing that? Obviously, there's corruption, right? So yes. That is the reason how it started. But then in this case, because there are, I would say, it is not merely, see, the, the uh, what you call expulsion of the encroachers from the reserved areas. It did not happen only with the cookies. Maitis were also thrown out. Yeah. Nagas were, Muslims were thrown out. Nobody protested. But why the cookies? So I think there is a vested interest group. And there is a close connection between political uh, leadership of uh, within that community with drug mafias and armed military organizations. So it is a very strong lobby which wanted to dethrone the present regime and let the status quo continue. But somehow it didn't work. But then they started taking the lullaby of what you call the scheduled tribe status to be given to, which is not connected at all. So the Maitis want a scheduled tribe status. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so and they have used this as an excuse to start the violence. Yes. Some, this has been going on among the Maitis. Now there is a sizable number of people who are wanting that Maitis should be given scheduled tribe. Hmm. Because we are indigenous people. Yes. Our way of worshipping, our livelihood, style, pattern are all indigenous. So why are we exempted? Hmm. Uh, there are many reasons I don't want to go into that. Yeah, fine. But... Uh, the Kuki leadership, civil society groups, and they also influence the Naga civil society groups to jointly protest against giving the Maitai scheduled tribe status. Mm -hmm. I do not know what triggered this, because this is an official matter. The government of India will investigate into that. Maitai never objected to their becoming STs. But whether we are qualified to be an ST or not, it is not the interest of any this or that group. It doesn't concern them. Concerns them. Yes. So uh, that excuse was made to burn the houses of many villagers 
in Churasarapur district. And this was happening, but I must also tell you that though this was a pretext, uh, prior to that, when I said some last few years before that, all these sacred deities, they put a cross there, they started praying in the name of Jesus, right? So the indigenous sacred places are vandalized slowly. People were stopped to go for worshiping. So lots of disenchantment among the Maitis. This was happening for few years. And this on 3rd of May, prior to that on 28th of April, uh, Chief Minister was supposed to go to Churachandpur to inaugurate a gym of one of the uh, MLAs there. But somehow they burned the entire place and uh, all this started. But it was slowed down. But why it again erupted in 3rd May is something beyond the imagination of the common man. Because this thing is very well planned. Because people coming out for protest against Maiti becoming settled, right? But then people are coming with AK-47 in their hands. And Manipur police based in Churachandpur are also going along with them. So what is police doing? And police chief, the DGP, is a cookie fellow. So it is a very strange matter that it is, seems to be quite well planned. And coordinated. Coordinated. It did not happen in the Naga areas. They protested, but it was peaceful. But why the violence to burn the houses of the Maitis? But unfortunately, the reaction from the Maitis were also quite a large on 4th of May. I must also confess that perhaps uh, if we could have avoided that, things would not have gone that bad. But people were very, very unhappy. And this was going on for some time. But Nagas, when they protested, they blocked the road. Economic hardship the Maiti had in the valley, where, of course, Nagas were also suffering, when Nagas blocked the national highways. But there were hardly any bloodshed. But this time, the cookies started on 3rd May. That was the most unfortunate and the replication or return of the Maitis were still equally bad and perhaps even worse, I would say. So what's been happening since May 23? So the Imphal Valley is essentially under siege now, isn't it? Yeah. Completely ring-fenced by various terrorist see, camps and all that. Uh, see, it is like this. I do not know why, what makes the government of India do this. But government has somehow, I'm talking of the central government, uh, we don't know, but now the chief minister of the state has said it is Article 355 in operation. It is like quasi president's rule. It's not a president rule fully, but home matters. The security is taken up by the center. So there is a security advisor, a retired IPS officer, who is coordinating both the Assam Rifles, BSF, Paramil, CRPF, and Manipur Police. It is all under him, not under the chief minister. That is what the minister himself has clarified. He was keeping quiet for quite some time, but recently he came out that it is 355 in operation. Now, what they have done is all along the hills that covers the valley, at certain points, Assam Rifles, Gurkha Regiment, CRPA, BSF are all stationed. Along with that, there are uh, camps of the Kuki insurgent groups. Then also you will find the village protection forces, both of the Kukis and also Maitis, at different pockets. It's like a war zone. So if you have an arms in hand, you can shoot to protect or attack. But imagine of the poor people. For you must have heard about woodcutters, because some of the villages do not have gas connection for cooking. So they have to depend on the nearby forest area to dry, to get dry twigs uh, to not only sell, but also consume. But four of them were killed by the cookies. They just came and invaded and these are unarmed. They only went and father and son duo was part of that four. So it was very unfortunate. I can still understand 
fight among the armed groups, but unarmed civilians being targeted, and, and not out of provocation, but very well articulated, is very unfortunate things that is happening. Today we don't have East Pakistan. Then where is this never-ending supply of arms and ammunition coming from? With the cookies have. What we come to know is uh, one is there is armed bazaar in Yunnan province of China. Here we go, Yunnan province, not far at all. Not at all. Not, not at all. People used to walk. They can walk across. Maybe a couple of months that people walk. Right. From Assam, from Manipur, there is story about people going. But today, I'm sure it's much faster. Yeah. yeah. And then secondly, many American signature, mm. French signature, German signature arms are also rifles, automated, long distance ones are coming. And there is also reports that some province in the northeast of Myanmar is also fighting against the military junta. But they yes. are also getting their arms and ammunition from, from somewhere. somewhere. From somewhere. Yes. And you know, it is right next door. Yeah. So either it is a Chinese market or is there also European traders, the West, American, the West. the West interest. I think the Americans have some Baptist or whatever presence in Myanmar. They, they are against the military junta. They mm. want a democratic government. Democracy they want. Oh, lovely. So they are democracy and then they are Christian population in the Chin groups. So they can have a good. Uh, base of mm. their political propaganda that they can play. And what is the role of the Arakan army in all this? They are, so they are awfully quiet these days, the Arakan army. No, they have already declared themselves autonomous, strong right now. They are all armed. Mm. The Rohingyas and the others who fled many from Myanmar, but they fought back. Mm. And these are also a strong uh, force to which Kunta has to contain. The entire, if you see, western side of, uh, southwestern of Myanmar, below Bangladesh, mm. is whole Arakan area. Yes. And they are very strong out there. Yes, yes. And India have to deal with its Sitwe project. Yes. Which passes through all this up to Ijo. Yes. How will they manage with this? We are going to have to find a way, apparently. So, yeah. So, there is this extremely massive situ and, and unstable situation across the border in Burma. Yeah. And that's spilling over yes. into, into Manipur. And there are lots of forces at play. The Chinese are very much involved. The West is involved. The West doesn't want the Burmese junta to stay in power. The Chinese want the junta to stay in power, but in, under certain conditions, yes. so that they can play that leverage game. Yeah. And Manipur is suffering as a consequence. So it's a geopolitical issue, actually. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Now, so it's clear that the problem that we are facing in Manipur is because more than half the state is occupied by foreigners. Now, what do you think is the solution long term? Obviously, there is no solution next week or next month. It has to be a long term solution. What could be the solution? See, uh, as you have rightly showed, the geopolitical threat that India is facing. But at the same time, India has to act. Because already it has started act this policy, transnational highway, railways and the trade uh, corridor that you want to develop via Myanmar. Via More. Via More. Yes. So, economic interest of India actively engaging with the Southeast Asian nations, with ASEAN, is a reality that India wants to have. And you have China as impinging or hindrance to this. It will not like India to do well in it this. It would area. not like that. And as long as insurgency keeps erupting, either in Myanmar or in the Northeast, your economic uh, transaction and the free flow is going to be disturbed. So, and even Japan is interested to have the entire area free trade zone. They would love to have that. Yeah. They, have, they have been investing for quite some time. Yeah. So, yes. even in Manipur, for the drinking Manipur. water project they have done, yes. even corridor linking of the road, Japan government is trying, uh, ADB is trying to do it. So, lots of interest in economy. Now, how do India act on this? And now another problem is what you call the foreigners are also mingled with the local. Now you cannot throw away all the cookies saying that you are not indigenous. My, my reading is this. So there are certain, you have to make certain year base mark. For the NRC. NRC. What year should it be? See, 
there is all fighting for 61, 51, I do not know. I mean, or whether you want to make it 71 when the state comes into being. 1891. 1891. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is going to be a million dollar question, but you mm -hmm. have to come to an uh, understanding. But the just, it should be fine. We have to decide a specific year, maybe 1949, 51, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it should give justice to the indigenous people. Absolutely. Of the land, absolutely. Not, not the foreigners. Absolutely. So, what not stakeholders? Absolutely. But the point is, uh, how is it going to happen when the state, uh -huh. uh, both in the center hmm. and also in the province, that is the state governments, Manipur, have remained so silent? Allow it to happen. I think it's the legacy of the many past decades of inaction yes. and, and, and yes, absolute messing up of the place. So, first thing, what the Home Minister has done is to stop this FMR. This is a welcome move. Of course, there are the free, free movement regime. Okay. Hmm. So, uh, that any Burmese or uh, Kukichin group could come up to 16 uh, uh, kilometers and they can stay up to two weeks, but who knows they are staying for decades. Yes. And I think Indians will not go to that side no. and stay there because the economy is not there yes. to sustain. Yes. So, naturally, the people will come to that side. So that has to be stopped. Your citizens' interest is of utmost uh, prerogative for you. Yes. And secondly, the armed smuggling and insurgency movement. By insurgency, I'm not talking the cookies or nagas alone. Whoever. Right. Whoever. Whoever. So that has to be stopped. So border fencing is a must. As I told you that with the border fence and with the Waga border, you could see the presence of the Indian state. That presence must be visible in the Northeast as well. So once you do that, free movement, cross-border terrorism, smuggling, these are stopped. Then you can fish out what is to be done inside. Hmm. That is the state's responsibility. It is. Uh, but you have also said what else? Now, uh, demographic changes happening, but so much of mistrust across communities is happening. It is not going to be very easy to heal. So even if you sustain the state with so much of mistrust and anger, with the way buffer state is formed, this side of the people going to that side get killed, or that side of the people coming to this side get killed, this is not the way for human civilization to go on. So one must also look for dialogue. Dialogue is a must. There are many voices among the Kuki groups who are same voices. They must be brought out. And there are also people in the Maitis who wants. And so is in the Nagas. Because this animosity, this anger, confrontation, I can understand the problem because you cannot undo many of the things that has happened. That's a reality part of life. So you have to negotiate, talk, and where it is agreeable, not agreeable, at least sit down and discuss. That needs to be done. Uh, that has not happened. Many cookies are displaced from valley who have lived for hundreds of years. Hundreds when I say 200, 300 years. So they should not also be treated in that way. I mean, uh, as a responsible person, I am speaking. So is the case of Maitage in Churachanto. But cookies at the moment, they are civil society groups. I think they have a political agenda of having their land. They have not so far have a land so far. In Burma also, they don't. They, are, they don't have. Yeah. They want to have it. They want a land of their own, a country of their own. Yeah, of their own. Got it. I think we have completely explored everything related to this matter. I hope there is sufficient clarity that the audience has got from this. Any parting words would you like to say? See, violence is only a means expressing your political statement. But that cannot be an end of the process. There has to be certain negotiation, settlement, and normalcy that has to be brought out. 
rule of law has to be followed. Otherwise, it will be a jungle raz. So we have to ensure that our lives are sacred and we come back to the normalcy. For that, we should explore any possible ways not to merely live in the world of antagonism. This will not take you too far. No. Got it. Dr. Oynam, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please share this on your Twitter, Instagram and WhatsApp so that this podcast reaches a wider audience.